Hi, uh, welcome to the e Sikshana program. We'll be seeing the last uh, topic in module five of electrical power quality. So this is Professor Umar Rao from RV College of uh, Engineering. So in my last session, uh, I had discussed the three major interfaces between the DG and the utility, namely the synchronous machine, the induction machine, and the power converter. So in this session, we will see what are the various PQ issues with DG and uh, some standards described for these. So what we are going to see is how the distributed generation is going to have an impact on normally occurring PQ disturbances. So what disturbances we will be seeing are, the first one is sustained interruptions. So interruption is when the load is unserved or there is no power to the load. So this falls into the area of reliability. If there are interruptions, my supply becomes unreliable. So many of the DGs are provided with, um, many of the utilities are provided with backup to take over the load when there is a power interruption. Now, do DGs actually help to reduce the interruption? We can't say because the DG may contribute to the faults. And in fact, the DG may actually increase the number of interruptions in some case. So I told you how the presence of a DG can interfere with the protection scheme and protection strategy of the utility. So in such cases, there is full possibility that the DG will actually increase the number of interruptions. The second issue we will be looking into is the voltage regulation. So here we should see how much of DG can be accommodated on a distribution feeder. Remember when I talk, when I use the word distribution generation, we are talking of the energy being geographically distributed and also occurring on the distribution side of the network. So how much of DG can I accommodate without creating severe voltage regulation problems? Then the third issue is the harmonics. So these harmonics, we have seen in chapter four and chapter three, how the harmonics are harmful to all the components in the system, your transmission lines, your cables, your transformers, your rotating machines, your loads like computers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So how these are affected with DG and uh, voltage sags. Can a voltage sag be improved with a DG or does it worsen? So these are some issues uh, I will be addressing in this session. So first, let us take a sustain interactions. So the most popularly used DG for a backup is the diesel generator. So I think we all know, you know, big apartments, commercial complexes, campuses, hospitals, uh, all of them, they have a diesel generator. So there is a transfer of power from the utility to the DG the diesel generator as soon as the utility supply is interrupted. So rarely does the DG work in tandem with the utility. We don't normally operate a DG and the utility together. We don't do it, right? So the load is transferred from the utility to the diesel generators as and when there is a disruption of the utility power. So the performance will improve and reliability will improve when these DGs are parallel to the grid. And the sizing of the DG should be such that it can supply the load entirely when the utility is off. 
That means no loan should go unserved. So, or when a part of the utility power is lost, then the DGs can partially uh, deliver the power to make up for the loss. So, what the utility is achieving by this is they are deferring the investment on capacity building. See, for example, uh, supposing now the load is 500 uh, kilowatts and uh, let us say it increases to around 550 uh, kilowatts. So the utility obviously cannot increase their capacity by 50 kilowatts. It's too small. So what they can do is 50 kilowatts, they can just supplement that with a diesel generator, with a backup, right? And when the load increases further to say, so maybe, maybe 800 or so, they can add another 500 kilowatts. So by adding distributed generation, the utility can defer their investment on capacity building. Clear? And to this extent, in this perspective and context, the DG can help to improve the reliability. But very soon, you know, the load growth may overtake whatever capacity we have built with DG. And then, then it may not be sufficient. Then the only way you can go is for capacity building of the utility. Otherwise, you have to resort to load shedding. Now, voltage regulation. Uh, sometimes the DG can improve voltage regulation as the generator controls are faster and smoother compared to cap changing transformers and using capacitor banks. But then I, I discussed at length in the previous session, what are the problems, other problems you will face if you use the DGs in voltage regulation mode. So if the DG is located relatively far from the substation, okay, then voltage regulation issues are often the main factor about the limiting accommodation of the DG without changing the system. Otherwise, what is it that you have to change in the system? See, I already have a voltage regulation strategy and control in place on the utility side. So when I add DG, right, it is very much possible that this DG will interfere with the already existing voltage regulation schemes. Though it is faster, Right. So the conventional voltage regulation you would normally have is tap changing on load tap changing or capacitor switching. So though the DG control is faster, it may interfere with that. So we have to be very careful and it may also uh, misoperate the protection scheme on the utility side. In general, if you have synchronous machines because of the excitation control, the voltage regulation is possible. But if the interface is using induction machine or inverters, these two generally have very poor voltage uh, uh, regulation as they do not have reactive power capacity of their own and hence are not good for voltage regulation. Normally, utilities do not prefer utilities, I repeat, utilities themselves do not prefer to hand over voltage regulation function to the DGs, right? There is another problem. When I have multiple DGs, after all it is distributed, no? there is no restriction that I should have only one, then these DGs may interact and this may further deteriorate actual voltage regulation. And if DGs are of small size, they will not have the capacity to regulate the voltage also. So in short, you can say that DGs are not effective in voltage regulation. They are not actually meant for voltage regulation. Now, the DJ can take up the, the voltage regulation uh, duty if there is sufficient, you know, if there is a rapid change of load up and down, up and down. So, this can also create a problem because the DG can suddenly disconnect, right? And when the DG disconnects, what happens? The voltage regulation will worsen. 
and this may pose a burden on the actual OLPCs, it's right? So it will take about a minute or so for the voltage to uh, uh, recover. And if there is a fault on the utility side, the DG may even get disconnected, anti-islanding. That's what we want to do. And because of this, what happens? There might be a deep voltage sag. Clear? See, I have, I have the utility and the DG parallel. Now there is a fault on the utility side because of which there is a sag and the DG gets disconnected. Okay, and then what happens, the fault may recover and I try to connect the DG and it may result in an over voltage. It may result in an over voltage. So this issue has to be taken into account. So what I am trying to tell you is that voltage regulation will be more complicated in the presence of DGs. And don't be under the impression that the DG will improve it. In most cases, it will worsen the voltage regulation. And so we must have control strategies properly to connect and disconnect the DGs at the proper uh, time during disturbances. The third problem is harmonics. So uh, the, see we have conventional harmonics in the grid due to some loads. Now what am I doing? I am interfacing uh, an inverter at the location of the DG to evacuate the power and transfer the power from the DG say to the grid. We are not talking of a standalone system uh, here. Now we may have harmonics at the switching frequency of the inverter. I told you today because of uh, PWM uh, techniques, PWM techniques. Uh, we use high switching uh, frequencies. So if there is a harmonic uh, of the order of the switching frequency, it can cause resonance. This can be reduced by uh, connecting a, a filter which can shunt off the harmonic component. If you recollect in my previous session, I told you how LC filters are connected at the output of the um, inverter. Now, the other problem is we discussed the utility can effectively block third harmonic currents, that is the zero sequence currents, by using a delta connected transformer. Whereas this is not possible for a DG. So if we are using synchronous machines, then these will, uh, you know, there's a full possibility that these machines will inject third harmonic currents into the grid and therefore to reduce the third harmonic current, the machines must be designed with two-third pitch. Next, voltage sags. Can EG actually help in case of a voltage sag or not? You cannot generically say this. Because first, it will depend on, on the DG technology you use and also where you are interconnecting. For example, you take this uh, here. I have a DG here, right? Then I have a load and I have the generator, whatever it is. It could be a diesel generator or uh, it could be a, uh, driven by a um, combustion engine or a reciprocating engine. And uh, I have another customer here connected to the up, upstream, right? So in this case, supposing let us say there is a fault on the utility side because of which there is a voltage sag. Then here, this DG may help to mitigate the sag for the load at this bus. But it, is, it will not help because it is not large, you know. It will not help to mitigate the sag for the other customer connected directly to the Clear. So, whether a DG can effectively control or even reduce the impact of the voltage sag will entirely depend on where the DG is connected to the utility, at which point it is connected. So, at the PCC, it may alleviate the sag, but upstream, it may not uh, help. It may not help. So, what are the standards? 
So we have uh, two industry standards. The first is the IEEE 929-2005 standard. So what does this standard address? So this standard was uh, prescribed to address the requirements for inverters used specifically with PV systems integrated with the unit. Any type of inverter, whatever is the inverter configuration, it can be applied, the standard is applied. This standard mainly prescribes the anti-islanding scheme. Anti-islanding scheme means when should the DG be disconnected, when the utility is disconnected. So what is done here in this standard is we use a destabilizing signal given to the inverter, right? And what this destabilizing signal will do is it will quickly control the switching pulses to the inverter the moment a fault is detected on the utility side, right? So what this signal will do is it will drift the frequency. This, the frequency measure will change. And the moment the frequency is observed to change, then immediately the inverter will be isolated. So we discussed in the last session why this is a must because eye landing can provide, you know, uh, can be very dangerous. So we should disconnect at the DGs whenever the utility power is lost. So this standard mainly gives directions on how this can be done with inverters. Then the other standard is um, IEEE P154710 standard. So the idea here is to develop a national standard for all types of uh, interconnections, both in um, radial and uh, meshed systems. See here, it is very difficult to develop a standard because you know the configuration is not fixed. The DG can be located at different points and the voltages of the DGs and the ratings of the DGs are very different. So you, you can even you can have household uh, rooftops generating solar power at 10 kilowatts and trying to sell it to the grid. You can have solar farms of 2000 megawatts. I can have a small uh, uh, plant with a micro turbine of 100 uh, kilowatts or 50 megawatts. So you see, there's a wide range and uh, it is very difficult to develop standards for this. So the interconnection requirements as prescribed by the standard are for uh, voltage regulation. The DG uh, shall not attempt to regulate voltage when it is interconnected. I have told you at length, voltage regulation is not a function which the utility will give the DG. It will retain it itself unless the utility wants. So the utility should prescribe whether the DG is involved in the voltage regulation or not. Otherwise, the DG should not operate in the voltage regulation mode. So it should rather operate in the constant power factor or constant reactive power output acceptable to the operation of the systems. Now, inverters normally when they are interconnected will produce a current that is in phase with the utility voltage to achieve a particular power level. And uh, anti-islanding, very important from a safety perspective. The DG shall have a relay, some, some kind of a relay, uh, you know, it, uh, which will detect the, uh, when it is operating as an island and immediately disconnect the DG from the power system. So basically what any island, anti-islanding strategy should do is, it should be able to know when a DG is islanded. What is the meaning of a DG being islanded? The DG continues to supply the load even after the utility is disconnected. So there must be a strategy to detect this condition. And the moment it is de detected, the DG should be disconnected. And the inverters should be compliant with the 929-2000 standard so that they naturally drift in frequency and they can be isolated. So the relay what we do to detect these resonant conditions that might occur should be applied in susceptible DG applications. So if I'm using some capacitors on the DG side and there is a chance of resonance occurring, then I must have a relay in place to detect such, such conditions and isolate the DG 
20s and 20s upper. Then what should the standard address when it has to develop some standard for fault detection? So all the DGs must be equipped with a relay scheme to detect faults on the utility side and disconnect the DG from around 0.16 to 2 seconds. That means very fast to dis disconnect very fast. The DG should disconnect sufficiently early in the first reclose interval. So you see the breaker opens, right? At that time, the DG should not disconnect because the fault may clear. If the DG disconnects, then unnecessarily you may have load interruption. So therefore, it should, why this 0 0.16 to 2 seconds is, it should wait for the first reclosure and then disconnect. Otherwise, you will you'll have what is called as a nuisance tripping. So when a fault is temporarily cleared, that the, the, when a fault is cleared, the DG need not trip. So if a DG trips too fast, then you may have a nuisance tripping because the fault would anyway clear in the next reclosure, there will not be a second tripping. So this optimal time for DG tripping should be arrived at. It should be too fast, it should be too slow. If it is too fast, you will have nuisance tripping. If it is too slow, you have the problem of islanding and you have the problem of safety. So this 0.16 seconds is 10 cycles in uh, 60 hertz. So this is allowed to allow a time for faults on the transmission system or adjacent feeders to clear. See, a lightning may strike an adjacent system, adjacent parallel feeder. So the DG should not trip because the lightning will go off anyway. So at the next reclosure of the breaker, the lightning would have disappeared. So and the DG should be still on. Supposing you have tripped the DG, DG very fast, then when, when then on the next reclosure of your parallel line, unnecessarily you would have had a nuisance tripping of the DG. It has to be again synchronized and interfaced to the grid. So this aspect is very important. And uh, the standard is aiming at developing a national standard for all types of interfaces. Then direct transfer trips. This, what happens is, supposing, because the DG technology is so varied in technology and in size and rating, it is difficult to detect, uh, it is difficult to detect islanding occurring on the, on the DG side. Then automatically when the utility trips, there is a breaker connection to the DG breaker, there is a connection and the DG also trips. So this is called as a direct transfer trip. So just see here, for applications where it is difficult to detect islands, that means utility is off and DG is still supplying and utility side falls, this is one issue. Or where it is not possible to coordinate with utility fault clearing devices, direct transfer tip should be applied such that the DG interconnect breaker trips simultaneously with the utility breaker. That means you can have the same trip signal for both the utility breaker as well as the interconnection breaker. The same relay which detects the faults can trip both of them. The transfer trip is usually advisable when DG is operating in the voltage control mode. Okay, because Amongst the three modes, that is constant power factor, constant reactive power and voltage control, the DG is most likely to operate in islanded mode when it is using voltage control. Okay, And uh, this transfer trip is not, uh, it's expensive in terms of uh, you know, the tripping cost and therefore a direct transfer trip is executed for large reasons. DGs, not for small DGs. Small DGs, the impact is not so high. Okay. So these are what the standards are trying to address. So with this, uh, we have come to the end of the fifth module. Thank you.